I'm, I'm Bill Gervasi. I'm the uh, principal systems architect for Nantero. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm a, a chairman at JEDEC. And so what I'm going to be going over is a, a standard that I wrote in JEDEC recently and was just passed two weeks ago and is being sent to the board of directors for publication. So you're getting a first glance at a brand new specification called JESD 312. It's an automotive SSD standard. So the thing that I wanted to cover is to chat about what, where cars are today because cars have become a part of the uh, data infrastructure. And um, so we needed to address some of these new requirements and look at what are the features that are going to be needed for the next generation of solid state drives that are gonna be going into this automotive marketplace. Then I'm gonna talk about what we did in the, uh, the new JETIC standard for automotive drives, and then give you some insights as to how you apply that to the automotive requirements. And then finally, where do we go from here? Now that we have made this evolution, where are we going to take that? So it used to be that automotive electronics was kind of a second thought, that you fundamentally took uh, whatever components you had and then stressed them beyond uh, the, the commercial specification. You increased your temperature range, you did your shock and vibration to address those requirements, but it was fundamentally you just took whatever components you developed for other applications and moved them in there. Instead, it's emerged as a major marketplace. You can see that the automotive marketplace is projected to grow uh, up to $65 billion. It's a 9.5% compound annual growth rate. So it's, this marketplace is literally exploding. And if you noticed with the CHIPS Act, the, a, lot of, a big part of the CHIPS Act was addressing this shortage and keeping the automotive marketplace from being stifled. So this is a new uh, a factoid in the, in the industry, something that has become very significant. And in looking at the requirements of this marketplace, we needed to understand what were the problems that we were being solved here. So you look at the self-driving cars in particular that are gonna be starting to emerge 2026, 2027, 2028. That generation of cars, they have input sensors all over the vehicle, hundreds of them, literally, and they're not all the same type. Some of them might be LIDAR, some of them might be optical, and some of them are uh, radio transmission. And so with all of these input sensors collecting this data, and now you have multiple displays and they're moving to 4K displays with the uh, high resolution color and so forth. You have the connection to the network. You have uh, them communicating with cars adjacent to them, communicating with street lights and so forth. In vehicle entertainment, maps and traffic, all of this stuff. You're talking about 300 gigabytes per second of data moving in a single vehicle. It is a data center now. Now, we didn't want to solve the whole problem. We just needed to come up with a solution for the solid state drive that associated with that. And fortunately, that's a little bit more modest requirement. So the uh, data storage requirement is in that kind of standard range, 128 gigabytes for your low end cars, maybe going up to four terabytes for your high end vehicles. So that gave us a reasonable range for us to design something that would be a uh, one, one uh, solution fits all. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, that's what that math, that's what that math comes out to. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, that, that image of, uh, of a person stepping off the curb you only need like, what, a quarter of a second to predict whether they're moving towards the street or away from the street. Yeah. A, a lot of that is ephemeral. So the network has changed. Um, 
cars are starting to adopt a fabric-based approach. So based on what you've been hearing since Monday of this week, the architecture of the car is actually a whole lot like what we've been talking about all week in terms of data centers, where you're going to have a network of processors and they're all gonna be gen uh, specific purpose. You're gonna have one uh, system on a chip that is addressing all of those sensors and collecting that sensor data. You can have a separate chip for entertainment, a separate chip for communications, a separate chip. So these, it, most of these cars are starting with four CPUs and the higher end cars, eight or 12 C CPUs that are sharing a network of resources. There's already a bunch of processors and it's not going to get consolidated because art, especially the artificial intelligence necessary to do object recognition, that's doing 300 gigabytes per second itself, right? Just for the image recognition. And so, no, you, that's not gonna get consolidated into a single CPU um, anytime soon. Uh, but so with this network of, of processors, thing that was missing was the, uh, the fabric. And so the, the trend is for these vehicles to all converge on PCIe as the interconnect uh, fabric for all of these processors, and then a shared resource of that SSD. So this is where moving towards essentially putting NVMe on a chip became a requirement for this marketplace. So, Take a look at what's needed, the performance, the temperature range, the reliability and long life expectancy for these devices, the security aspect. Uh, I don't think any of us want our cars hacked. And yet it still needs to be reasonably cheap. So these were the factors that we took into account in the development of the JETIC standard for this drive. And this is it. Um, like I said, approved in, uh, at the August JETIC meeting, moving to the board of directors should be published by the end of the year. It's called uh, JESD 312, revision 1.0 just approved. It is a single chip BGA solution for this marketplace. So first thing I wanted to cover was what's the package in the pinout. Then I'm gonna talk about the electrical interface, the command protocol security, the storage regions in this device, and finally I'll take a look at the endurance on that. Package and pinout, it's a 28 by 28 millimeter BGA. Uh, thickness ranges 1.2 to 2 millimeters. We considered making a standardized heat spreader solution for this, decided against it, decided to push that onto the, uh, the system guy to do the uh, heat spreading. 0.8 millimeter pitch, this footprint gave us the capability to support that range, because that's a pretty wide range to go from 128 gigabytes up to four terabytes. Some of the solutions are gonna be multi-chip solutions with on-chip power regulation and a lot of other factors. So we wanted to make this solution flexible enough to cover that range of, of um, densities. <clears throat> now, not everybody wants or needs a 28 by 28 BGA. Uh, if you're going to make a 128 gigabyte SSD, you don't need that kind of footprint. You can get by perhaps with a 16 by 20 package. And in that case, what you do is you choose that inner row of pads to sit on. Similarly, you can expand out to 20 by 24 and now you use that same inner row where all the signals are, but you have these mechanical support balls that keep the package stable in that same footprint. The next size up is a 22 by 28 footprint, or finally the 28 by 28. So this is how we were able to support 
multiple suppliers, multiple ranges of capacity, and all that the car designer has to do is lay out the 28 by 28 footprint, and he can accept any of those four package sizes in the same footprint. From an electrical interface standpoint, we support PCIe 4.0 with a by four interface. This gives us 32 gigabytes per second of peak throughput going to that device. In addition to that, the system management bus is required and the JTAG for testability in the uh, test environment. From the command protocol standpoint, we require that you support the PCIe 4.0, uh, NVMe 1.4C or better. You're required to have the system management bus and the JTAG. And the other thing I wanted to point out in this slide here is notice the large number of external standards that we're relying on. So the JETIC specification is not an overall encapsulation of every um, command byte, not every uh, electrical interface. What we do with the genetic specification is we pull together a set of requirements, but then we make references to the external specifications. So you go to IEEE to get JTAG, you go to PCIe to get the PCIe spec, you go to NVMe to get the NVMe spec. We collected all of those things into one uh, referencing document. Yeah. Um, are you I don't know the answer to that one. Am I? Oh, the man management interface. The management. There are some references to it. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure there was a specific reference in there. Um, the one thing that was, it was a very debatable subject, though, was the middle one, uh, virtualization. This, is, this was a hot topic in discussions because, again, you have anywhere from four to eight to 12 processors sharing this resource. Where do you do that allocation of the resource? And single root IO virtualization is a pretty well accepted and expanding uh, requirement, but it imposes a lot of uh, extra hardware in the SSD to manage those tables. So we did not make it a, a firm requirement. We made it an optional feature. And what, do I, what does optional mean? Optional means that it's gonna be driven by the industry. So this is a case where if you are a supplier looking at producing this part, you need to go and talk with the car designers and with the SOC suppliers to find out if SRIOV is going to be required in your device for that specific customer. Um, and again, with the SOC suppliers, it's a pretty big thing as well because SRIOV obviously needs for all of the components to operate on a compatible protocol. So this is an area that is still developing it is getting a lot of uh, steam in other groups as well, in PCIe, PCI SIG and so forth. So this is one to keep your eye on. So the alternative is for the other two, you have to do that. Exactly, or to allocate one of, the pro one of the processors to manage for everyone. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, security. It's a pretty hot topic, obviously. Like I said, we don't want anybody hacking into our cars. So in this particular case, where we defined the, um, the SPDM boundaries, the security uh, protocol and data model, the SPDM boundaries for requesters and responders, we wanted to be forward looking on this. For example, the current PCI spe specification allows for 256-bit security algorithms we made the determination that that was not going to be sufficient. So one of the additions that we put, or one of the assertions beyond the, the PCI specification, is that we require that the 384-bit 
security algorithms be implemented on the automotive SSDs. And this was based on a recommendation by the NIST late, late last year that we start moving off of the 256-bit uh, security base. But there could be more than that. You can have more than that. Um, and in particular, there's at least one car supplier uh, who wants a, the, um, uh, a new elliptical algorithm to be used that is, they think, beyond this. Um, but that is, um, you know, not, it's not industry standard. It's not part of PCI yet. We expect that that car supplier may come to PCI SIG and encourage it. So we do allow it as an option. And in fact, we allow 256-bit to be an option because we don't necessarily want these devices to only be used in cars. You could take that and grow your market by selling it into a tablet, for example, where SRIOV would have no, uh, no great value. Similarly, 384-bit algorithms may be uh, overkill for a, a tablet that is designed for an older 256-bit. So you, you're allowed to have 256, 512, any of those other algorithms. Uh, you can put the elliptical algorithms in, but as a minimum, you must support this. And that uh, enhances what we do in JETIC, which is, of course, vendor interoperability. That you, at very least, if your controllers implement 384, they can take parts from any supplier and drop them into that footprint. Another uh, requirement is firmware resilience. Uh, you, clearly, you don't want your car to be doing a firmware update and the battery dies and now all of a sudden you don't have a car anymore. So firmware resilience is a, a required part of the specification as well. The ability to go in and, and essentially update your, your BIOSes in your uh, devices. You, you know, you're taking my thunder because I have a story about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the only, the only requirements are the, the signature and the hash. Right. Right. Yeah, th those are in the specification. Okay, here's another optional feature, one that was requested by the car suppliers, is, again, we're getting into this world where as a data center, you have, are now having a major distinction between applications that are critical and applications that are fluff. You absolutely want your steering and braking <laughs> to work but maybe if your music kicks out for a while because of a problem, that's less critical. So uh, to address that requirement, one of the features that we've put in is to have regions in your solid state drive. Hi and one of them would, is the uh, boot code operating systems, critical applications in the system region that needs to have a high reliability and we allow for bulk storage to have a lower reliability. One way to implement this is to allocate part of your flash as single level cell and part of your flash as multi-level or quad level cells. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the ways that can be done. And so, uh, and so some people are gonna have this as a fixed version, some, some suppliers are looking at making that programmable, where you can tell the device, I want 30% to be single level cell and the remaining 70% to be um, multiple levels in the, in the, the device. Yeah. Software -definable? It's in, for some suppliers, it can be software definable. That's correct.
It can be done. It can be done with separate chips, or depending on the supplier, it could be done with a, a, a single device where you can allocate a portion of it to be, you know, uh, use the. the, the That's rounding error. That's rounding error. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The same cell. Okay so, okay, so let's focus on the table. What the table is doing is, is suggesting, a, suggesting a minimum uh, ratio. So that in particular, there were a couple of, couple of things here, some technical and some marketing. The technical aspect of that is if you're gonna have a, uh, a, a large capacity drive like a terabyte drive, that as a minimum, you should at least offer 32 gigabytes of it as a protected region. Um, and then, so why, it, why would you need a larger protected region for a two terabyte drive? Well, that's where the marketing kicked in. We wanted to be able to encourage upselling for the suppliers to help increase their uh, profit margins. So, there's no technical reason for those barriers increasing. You're being too analytical. <laughs> Rounding error. Yeah. Well, You're being too analytical. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. These that, right? guess, <laughs> and guess what? I did not use Excel to do a calculation on this, right? <laughs> it's simple rounding error. Yeah. Yeah. You can subtract 64 gigabytes off of four terabytes if you want. And, you know, I'm sure you can take 4096 and subtract 64 and figure out what that number is. But, Again, this, but this could be separate chips. You know, to answer this gentleman's question, it could be a separate single level cell chip and a separate uh, bulk 3D NAND chip. Depends on the supplier. And so it actually, this math could be accurate and it could be inaccurate. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's how we came up with those numbers. The other thing that we did is we acknowledged that there are two pretty dramatically different marketplaces. One is the ordinary person's vehicle, and the other is going to be things like your semi. And that these are completely different business models. For example, a, a person has a car, they're gonna drive it maybe 344 days a year. So it allows for times that they don't get in the car, allows for going on vacation and so forth. And the average person only drives about three hours a day on average. So here, though, the person does not expect their SSD to wear out. So you expect that this SSD is going to last you 15 years with that particular usage model. On the other hand, if somebody's driving a semi, that thing is in operation every day of the year, in operation 12 hours a day, but you can expect a lower lifespan for that drive because you know that these vehicles are going to have maintenance cycles where, among other things, they're going to replace the solid state drive. So with that acknowledgement of the business cycles, now you can recalculate things like your expected reliability. And you know, you, uh, you probably, hopefully you can't read the data here, but it's saying that, for example, you might have a different drive right per day number for the consumer version 
versus the professional version of the drive. So this is an acknowledgement that the reliability is going to be different in those two marketplaces. Now, the other thing is, what is the usage model from a data standpoint? So we actually spent a fairly significant amount of time looking at how does this uh, drive get used? What's the, what are the data patterns? What's that mix of one kilobyte accesses versus uh, 64 kilobyte accesses and so forth? And the interesting thing, again, that trend towards being data centers on wheels was reflected in the fact that the usage patterns are almost identical to the enterprise model that is in the standard JETIC uh, reliability specifications, JESD 218 and JESD 219. So the SSD specification is pointing to the enterprise reliability models for drive endurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they come out. I was surprised. I was surprised that it was not a, a wider gap myself. Um, I, I don't know. I, I did not dig. I, I was also surprised that the numbers were that close. But uh, it, you know, it's also twice as many years, right? It, it's 15 years versus eight years. So it's going to be like you know, 12, 12 times 8. How different is 12 times 8 from uh, you know, um, three, time, 3 times 15 or whatever? Yeah. Uh, you have different, yeah, you, yeah, this is going to be the bulk region. So it um, took a couple of years, obviously. Jetta, you know, designed by committee, never goes fast. But hopefully we have a, uh, a, a good product at the end here. Uh, it you know, took us, about, like I said, about two years to finally get that specification approved. The um, security stuff, I will say, was the last factor in getting this out there. But it's out there now, and we're pretty pleased with uh, getting this completed. Now, I want to get to the story. And that is, I was driving down 280, obeying the speed limit, of course. But it was a kind of a rainy day. Keep, fortunately, keeping a nice, safe distance between me and the car ahead of me. When uh, lightning struck about 40 feet away, right at the side of the road next to my car, my, my rental car. And radio turns off. Screen went blank. What do you do? Let me tell you, there, was, there's a, there are moments of panic in your life. This was one of them. I had no idea, did I have steering? Did I have braking? Did I have anything? I, I just held onto the wheel. Fortunately, like I say, I had a nice distance between me and that other car because I just held onto the wheel, did not move my foot on the accelerator, and I waited, after a few seconds, my link appeared on the screen. And a few seconds later, the radio started playing again, and the odometer came on and all that. But it was you know, roughly seven seconds that I was going uh, at speed limit down 280 and had no idea if my car was functional or not. So this affected my thinking as I was going through this process. <laughs> and as I started thinking about, well, where do I want to go next? And now I take off my Jetta hat and I can put my Nantero hat on because one of the things that I envision as being the next phase is we now unplug that uh, PCI drive and now let's imagine that we move towards a CXL module. And so this is what I've been talking with the car guys about, is making that migration. They've now gone to PCIe as the fabric. They are a data center. Data centers are moving to CXL. Cars should be considering the same thing as well. And the migration to CXL 
allows us now to start moving towards all the goodness of a CXL model of things like maybe you can now get an instant on where you can put all of your critical operations data in a shared resource and all of those processors now suddenly boot instantly instead of having to load off of uh, off of flash memory attached to an SPI interface and so forth. They can now um, have that permanent storage. We can have leave it in place execution and start consolidating some of that resource and simplifying the cost and reducing the cost of the uh, automotive solutions. And just in general, the, the improved fabric coordination that comes from having a CXL interface, things like, gee, maybe that um, communications unit does need to com communicate with the artificial intelligence image recognition engine where now maybe this car can even warn a street light that it detects that there's a person that is jaywalking and maybe to control, to tell the speed light, uh, to tell the street light to change states to, to protect that human from getting hit. These are the kinds of things that we can start thinking about for future implementations. And having a CXL and shared memory architecture leads the uh, automotive industry in the same direction that we're taking data centers. That's it. Um, the self-driving cars were the big motivator here. Yes, sir. I'm the one that drove the I3C adoption in JETIC. And so, yes, we've already made that transition in JETIC. Um, the, we made a variation of it called Sideband Bus because the I3C guys were too stubborn about um, being able to reset the I3C link. So they would, didn't want to have a, a timed reset capability. Uh, but yes, we've already made that transition. And we've now, JETIC has a, a uh, MOU in place with the CXL organization. And so, uh, what's her name, Rochelle from uh, Intel? Yeah, Rochelle and I have communicated and we are going to be coordinating those discussions about moving to I3C and or sideband bus for the, S for the system management links to CXL, to these classes of devices, and then also what are the implications um, of that in terms of things like security enhancements and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, yeah, pick on. The, it, it follows the uh, um, it follows the ball map from the M2. The M2 document is where the ball map is defined, and uh, it does it, it does leave some some DNUs or um, some expansion options in there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. The big motivator was solving the problem for the self-driving cars. Again, that time frame is 2026 and beyond where uh, we're targeting the expansion of this device. And, but that means sampling needs to happen a lot sooner, right? You know that the evaluation cycles for cars are really, really long, so you know, you get those samples out there in their hands. Uh, the, but the migration to PCIe as the fabric for cars is well underway. And uh, the other point I wanted to remind you of is this is not just a JETIC standard. It does tie in with all of the efforts in PCI, in NVMe, in JTAG, and so forth as well. The, uh, we tried to strike that balance between having a reasonably large set of common requirements, but then still leave room for innovation in the drives. And finally, this adoption of PCIe we're encouraging the automotive industry to also take that extra step and go with CXL as well. And that's it.
And it's funny that you should mention that because while I was in that situation, in that seven seconds, that was exactly what was going through my mind is that I hope that those engineers have like 75 backup mechanisms so that a car with no power still works. Yeah. I, would I, I would not have. Yeah, there's a difference between you and me. I did not move a thing, not an inch. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was, that's been discussed. And no, Sam, actually Samsung has a separate specification that, is, that they moved through JETIC for a removable card which could take this BGA. So Samsung produced a specification for that exact thing. Now, at least one car supplier is going to use that, probably more. However, uh, in discussions with the wider range of car manufacturers, and I spoke with maybe six, six car design companies, what that removable module was going to be was not, was not a constant between them. Uh, we, in our industry, tend to think of things like, um, you know, the M.2 where you know, a notebook, you unplug an M.2, plug a new M.2 in. They think in terms of it's a subassembly that is one subassembly of 14 subassemblies. So it was not only necessarily going to be just the uh, SSD that you were replacing, but maybe also the communications processor or, and some other stuff. So there was no standard between those suppliers that I spoke with on what that removable subassembly scope would be. And so that's why it didn't make it in. Uh, how about up here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, the the one of the ways that power consumption is managed is. That right there. Uh, one of the ways power can be managed is uh, PCIe can be scaled down. And so one of the power management, uh, and, and also the PCIe, the power states, but you, you know, if you are not using 32 gigabytes per second and you want to save power, you can scale that down to a by one interface and easily knock you know, three quarters of a watt or a full watt out of that uh, interface just by scaling it down. So there's one mechanism. You have the power states that you can put this thing into. So that's another. So um, uh, yeah, it's it, it acknowledge that there's a trade-off. Uh, PCIe is not necessarily a, a free interface from a power standpoint, but none of them are. Well, or, or just um, contamination. And moisture gets into those sockets. Uh, they corrode over time. Sockets probably have a shorter lifespan than an SSD. <laughs> yeah. I 
That would be a question you'd have to take to the M.2 guys that defined the uh, the 28 by 28 roadmap. Yeah, this has already been sent to the automotive guys. Yeah. So, uh, my question is, is that the fallback of passage already been used by some? Oh, 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 oh. I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I understand the question about uh, the air correction, and I remember we uh, spent time on that in the early parts of uh, the discussion, so it's been two years. Give, give me some time to think about what the response was. Yeah, the, yeah the, air, the, the current PCIe error rates and the recovery mechanisms, I think they were considered uh, sufficient for this application. You know, again, it's only 32 gigabytes per second versus the 300 gigabytes per second of the overall data rate. It's, it, it's a reasonably small portion of it, and the majority of it is things like you know, streaming entertainment and so forth. So yeah, I think it was considered fairly non-critical from that standpoint. Oh, back in, in the back. Yeah, it was approved, and um, I, I haven't looked to see if it was published, but it was approved to be sent to the board of directors in like December of last year. Yeah. Yeah, that that'd be a, a, a that'd be a good email to the JEDIC office to find out what the publication status is of that. Um, I, I probably should have included a picture of that here because. Yeah, you know, that's a fairly anticipatable question that this BGA could fit into that frame and then be, you know, uh, that would be the carrier for those applications of where replacement of just the SSD is important. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, a dual port versus... No discussion of dual port. Uh, the, again, the bandwidth requirements were not that high uh, for this device. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time.